uh, can we do sound? <laughs> do we have sound on the live stream? Sound, sound on the live stream. Check, check, sound, check, sound. Yeah, yes, we have sound. Good. Sound on the live stream. Anybody? Yes. Yes, good. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. We can uh, uh, fade the music and join the live stream. So uh, welcome. Last day of Chem 1. Huh, everybody take a deep breath. Finally, we're here. Um, uh, one of the reasons I like to teach Chem 1, many, so many reasons, uh, all of uh, you out there, uh, so much more fun we get get to meet in person. Uh, but uh, as you know, this is uh, the chance for the College of Chemistry, the University of California, to uh, inspire the young minds uh, that are coming in, and maybe convince some of you uh, to go into chemistry or into science as a career. And the video you saw playing there indicates that we desperately need you women in the audience to please come into science. I apologize for our entire gender. You ever be embarrassed? You know, sometimes you're embarrassed if someone in your family does something and you're like embarrassed for your family. Uh, I, I heard about the NASA uh, tampon thing. I was, in, I was embarrassed for my entire gender. <laughs> so all of you uh, out there who uh, are thinking about going into science, uh, young women in science, we obviously need you desperately to straighten out uh, us. I, unfortunately, a uh, genetic accident was uh, uh, born male. I can't be a full role model to you, but please uh, come in and set us straight. Uh, so here's our roadmap. Uh, last day, this was also the first day we've been on this slide now six or seven times through the class as we ground ourselves in the journey that we're taking in Chem 1. Our goal on day one was to understand every detail possible of this slide. And uh, we've come a long way. So today's the last day. We'll summarize a little bit of what we've, uh, where we've come. Of course, we understand uh, particles and the particles come as atoms and molecules. And we understand how they are arranged into molecules, we understand the masses, the relative masses, and how we can go from the tiny particle to a macroscopic mass that we can measure in the laboratory and get appropriate ratios between the atoms with macroscopic masses. We can ensure that we have two hydrogen molecules for every one oxygen molecule by using either masses 
or we found we could use the volume of gases because we saw the volumes of gases were proportional to the number of particles. So we understand uh, the stoichiometry of chemical reactions, the interactions of atoms and molecules and the nature of chemical reactions themselves as those atoms rearrange from one molecule to another. We saw that mass was conserved when that happened, that we don't lose any particles. So the mass on the products and reactants side will be the same. One of the things, one of the conservation laws we encountered. And we talked then about the thermodynamics of the chemical reaction. And we came to this diagram hundreds of times, <laughs> literally during our journey, an energy diagram where products and reactants were ordered uh, on the uh, diagram, on an energy scale. And we saw if that energy scale was the free energy, then this is a measure of the relative amounts of products and reactants at equilibrium. We said a negative change in free energy. This is a free energy axis. A negative change in free energy means the products are favored at equilibrium. So if I go from a standard state where everything is uniform in one molar and it precedes spontaneously two products, that idea of spontaneity means it favors products. K is greater than one at equilibrium. We scaled that, those energy differences, by enthalpy and energy changes. And this, if this is an enthalpy scale, was an exothermic reaction, releasing energy. And we found that when energy was released in a system, it's always one for one absorbed by the surroundings. And energy is conserved in the universe. The amount of energy we have now is the same amount of energy that was released in the Big Bang. And that energy has been just interchanging being between different systems, different groups of particles in the universe. And we'll continue to do that with the same amount of energy. So energy was conserved. Uh, we looked then at the idea of the barrier between the products and the reactants. This, so we went from thermodynamics to kinetics, and we said this top part of the diagram is the realm of kinetics. This, these energies here that involve this uh, high energy barrier, this activation barrier, that's the realm of kinetics. That says how fast will the reactants go to products. This energy difference doesn't tell us anything about that. That's purely thermodynamics. We separated thermodynamics and kinetics so we could understand all the aspects of this diagram. We saw that you could change that barrier with the addition of a catalyst, and we did that several times. We're going to talk about that in uh, detail today. We're going to look at a, a lot of catalyzed reactions, enzyme-catalyzed reactions in your cells. But this low road does not affect, although it in, ex allows the reaction to proceed more quickly, there's a lower barrier, it does not change the energy difference. The energy released is the same. Whether it's a catalyzed, an easy road, or a hard road to get from one to the other, the energy release is the same. If you take nothing else home from Chem 1, take home the fact that energy is a state function. All that matters is the initial and final state, not how you got there, not the pathway that you got there. So if you know an initial state and a final state, that energy difference is the same. If you know a reactant state and a product state, the energy difference between those is the same regardless of the path you take to get there. Catalyst does not affect that thermodynamic uh, parameter. 
We looked in then a lot of detail at the structure of the atom. So we looked at the electronic structure of the atoms themselves. And as they form molecules, we looked at the molecular structure. And in some detail, we were able to determine the bond angles, the bond orders, the bond strengths in these molecules. So we were able to go from just a, a, a group of letters to an understanding of a change in atomic arrangements that led to different molecular structures and we could predict them based on simply uh, steric interactions, how the electrons fill space and how the atoms around a central atom fill space. So that was an in, uh, intuitive uh, argument, but we looked in detail about the quantum mechanics of that interaction, the bonding. And we saw how molecular orbitals are formed from our atomic orbitals. And molecular orbital theory allowed us to predict properties of molecules that we would not have been able to predict from a simple Lewis structure. And the big example of that you might remember is that oxygen, the molecule, has a double bond. In the Lewis structure, all the electrons appear to be paired, yet oxygen is paramagnetic. It has two unpaired electrons. And the, our great triumph of molecular orbital theory was we predicted that oxygen, the molecule, was paramagnetic. So uh, we continued and talked about, uh, most recently, the idea of oxidation and reduction. So now we understand these uh, chemical reactions in many ways. We understand the energetics of uh, enthalpies and free energies and entropies of these chemical reactions. But we also understand now that the oxidation states of the elements change, and that involves electrons passing from one element to another. And if an element gains an electron, it is reduced. Its oxidation number decreases, oxidation number reduced. So we have oxygen here is oxidation state zero in the molecule, and over here minus two in the water molecule, that is a reduction in the oxygen's oxidation state. In turn, the hydrogen was oxidized from zero to plus one, an increase in oxidation number. So, and we saw how we could separate oxidations and reductions into two separate vessels. And by the, the free energy difference between the products and reactants, we could induce electrons to go from one side, uh, from one beaker to another through a wire so that the reactants were going down free energy hill. We could use the free energy of a reaction to motivate electrons, to create electrical potential. Free energy is the available work the maximum uh, amount of useful work you can get from a system. We talked about that, and then we saw dramatically that you could uh, light up a light bulb, or you could have electrons travel from a zinc electrode to a copper electrode spontaneously because of the free energy difference of chemical reactions occurring in two different beakers. We talked about combustion, uh, a lot of combustion reaction now we understand in terms of the reaction, the explosion, the burning of a hydrocarbon. And uh, we understood that that is also formally an oxidation, the oxidation number of carbon changing from zero to plus four as that reaction occurs. Uh, here's another combustion reaction. This is glucose. And we saw, we talked about this, we burned a donut in oxygen, and we saw the tremendous amount of energy released by that. This is also a metabolic 
chemical reaction that happens in your body. Uh, we understand that uh, glucose is a uh, sugar, and that's a primary source of energy for our cells. And we're going to focus today on a lot of aspects of that chemical reaction and see how this is accomplished in your body. You've seen uh, a donut burn in liquid oxygen, and you saw the tremendous amount of heat and light given off. When you eat a donut, you don't have that occurring. I got a red light on my, uh, can you guys, is the audio on? Uh, tell me if the audio goes off because I got a red light on my mic here. Uh, we'll go to a chem quiz. I'll change the batteries on the first uh, chem quiz. Uh, uh, so how does that reaction happen in your body opposed to we don't feel explosions and bright lights going on. <laughs> it would be fun if you ate the donut and light came out uh, <laughs> of your eyeballs. But the your body does that in a very controlled and regulated way and gets those uh, joules of energy out. So that is, uh, I think we can be proud of ourselves. Uh, we've We've started on day one with that diagram and we know so much about it right now. That roadmap for Chem 1, you can take that home, make a 8 by 10 glossy picture of it, hang it on your wall, and remember Chem 1 and everything that you've learned about that, uh, that chemical diagram. So we're going to talk a little bit about reactions in your... Uh, body now. Can you double check, uh, send this, um, check the resolution? Uh, if you send this camera shot to resolution is good. So, uh, this is, we've talked about this, uh, compound once or twice before. I haven't drawn the structure of it. Here it is. This is called adenosine triphosphate. This is a, a ubiquitous molecule. Uh, <laughs> Ubiquitous. <laughs> I know when I use the, the arcane words, uh, ubiquitous means uh, occurs universally, everywhere, common, uh, in your cells. And you may have had some biology, and you understand that ATP, if you've had some biology, is uh, an energy transfer molecule in your cells. It's, it's the molecule that helps us get the energy from the combustion of the glucose to other parts in our body where we need energy to make a chemical reaction happen. So it's an energy transport molecule, but it is an acid. It's composed of uh, the adenine complex, this complex here, and these phosphate, there's a sugar, ribose, and these three phosphates. So uh, a adenosine or adenine adenosine triphosphate these three phosphates have acidic protons on them so if they have acidic protons these three have a pKa of around 6 and this one here at the end has a pKa around 2 so uh, we'll do, we're going to do some impromptu chem quizzes uh, where I haven't actually prepared a slide. I'm just going to write on the board and ask you uh, to answer A, B, or C. So here's the chem quiz. I'm going to ask you, and this is a, obviously we're preparing for the exam. This is a great exam question for uh, tomorrow afternoon. At pH 7, so in your body, what is the charge state of this molecule? So pH 7, we know these pKs. What is the charge on this uh, adenosine triphosphate? And we'll give you some uh, we'll give you some possible answers. Answer A, if you think the charge is zero. Answer B, if you think the charge is uh, minus one. And C, if you think it's minus four. 
I'll start the poll. And I should have started the poll before I wrote that on the board because now I have to <laughs> take it off the board and start the poll. I'll write it back on after we get the poll going. So you can use your software now to respond and I will write those possible answers on the board. pH seven is what we're interested in. And I wanna know the charge state of this molecule. Is it A zero, B minus one, C minus four? Think about that for a second. We'll take a vote. I'm gonna get new batteries in the mic and be right back with you. Uh, we'll come back uh, quickly and see what you're thinking on this. Oh, I have to turn this off, see what you're thinking. Uh, we're kind of equally uh, split between A, B, and C. So let's talk about that. Uh, we'll just talk about this together. We're going to do a lot of chem quizzes quickly today because this is a, a review. So uh, it is a polyprotic acid, and we talked about that um, already uh, now, it seems like forever ago. Uh, I think it might've just been uh, like three or four days ago, <laughs> but that's how fast we go. So there were different PKs for those different acid groups on the um, adenosine triphosphate. And we saw that as you titrate, as you add base, you remove protons. This is carbonic acid. It has two protons that can be removed. And as you remove them, the, when you get to a pH around the pKa, that is where you have half and half. You have an equal amount of an acid and a base form. And as you go beyond that, you go completely to the base form. So the pKa is the point where the proton starts to come off 
the acid and is in solution, that is a condition where we turn the acid into the base. So if the pH gets higher than the pKa, we go to the basic form. That was the take home lesson. At directly at the pH equal the pKa, there's an equal mixture of the acid and the base form. So for the case of ATP, those pHs, those pKa's all six at pH seven were above that. We've titrated beyond the pKa, and all those protons have come off. This was pKa two, and that proton has also come off. And the predominant form of ATP at pH seven is highly charged for negative charges. Uh, well, that brings us to a titration experiment. And uh, one of the things that happens in the summer, uh, especially this summer, and unfortunately, this is a remote class, uh, you guys don't come to Pimentel Hall, and you don't get to see the amazing uh, actual live demonstrations. We've watched them on the screen here, but seeing it live in person is, uh, is exciting. Uh, and you also don't get a feel right away for uh, the spirit of Cal, which is uh, just very close to my heart, as you know. Uh, so every year, uh, the, uh, we're talking about acids and bases in Chem 1A about the time, in football season, about the time where the Cal-Stanford football game uh, occurs. And as you know, it's one of the greatest rivalries in uh, college sports. Uh, we don't like those guys uh, over there in Palo Alto, uh, but we have a lot of fun in Chem 1, and I wanted to try to share a little bit of the fun with you, if I can, uh, here on our uh, last day of class. So here is uh, the Chem 1A classroom in the fall and we're about to we're talking about acids and bases and you can see what happens stand by the cal band charges in interrupts Kim, one lecture with the Vite song. Go right to the screen. Yeah, indeed. Uh, go back to me. Uh, this uh, this is uh, uh, Phil Geisler, uh, faculty here. Um, uh, another reason it is uh, we'd like you to come to Cal. You get to meet uh, fantastic people like Phil Geisler, probably uh, one of the finest uh, chemistry lecturers we have here on the faculty. Um, if you guys got me. I think you were gypped. Uh, Phil <laughs> is the guy you want to have. Uh, there's a guy in our audience today who taught both of us how to teach Chem 1. Uh, Professor Alex Pines is in the classroom. Um, Alex, uh, do you want to just say hi quickly? Uh, uh, Alex Pines, my mentor, my academic grandfather. I got my PhD from his first PhD student, and he taught both Phil and I how to teach Chem 1. 
uh, invented this whole idea of chem quizzes and how do we teach chem here at Cal. And uh, Andrew, is it possible to bring him uh, up onto the the Zoom? So he's he's the screen. Yeah, uh, we'll we'll uh, bring Alex up. He'll be able to say hello. I don't. Where did we attach you? We attached you here. Is this HDMI one? Stand by. We've never done this before. That's not your computer? It is. But you don't see the Zoom? Uh, can you drag uh, with your mouse, drag the Zoom yes. over here? Thank you. Hi, Alex. Uh, you can say hi. It'll be delayed. Uh, you'll, they'll, you'll hear, they will hear you in the Zoom, uh, but you can say hi if you'd like. So you can go to screen on this. Our, our feed can go to just this screen if you want. I can't hear what's going on. Sorry. We, can, we can hear you? Yeah, we can hear you, Alex. Pull everybody out of the breakout rooms. Um, and I ended up, uh, like, making these just, like, the nine pages, which is one. Alex, we're just pulling everybody out of the breakout rooms to make sure the audio goes through. Yes. Yep, yep, continue. 12. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Alex.
So uh, thanks, uh, Alex, for uh, doing that. And uh, Alex is uh, right, and I, I've mentioned that same thing before. The chem quizzes, you are supposed to enjoy them, but uh, scratch your heads as much as we do. There's no, uh, uh, there's no way uh, undergraduates coming in first thing are going to get these. Alex and I, who have uh, created many of them, yeah, we look back the next year and go, God, what the devil were we thinking? Uh, that's the experience you have. You're having it right here along with us. And uh, Professor Bynes, uh, uh, you can mute so he doesn't hear this, uh, uh, is one of the most brilliant people in uh, the world, <laughs> one of the most brilliant minds we have here at uh, Cal. We're fortunate to have him. People like Alex Pines is what make Berkeley what Berkeley is, the center of the intellectual uh, universe in uh, chemistry, especially. Um, when you talk about how smart people are, you, it's hard, you know, the, the smartest people in the world. Did you, did you watch, um, if you watch the Olympics and you watch uh, any event um, in the swimming pool, the top people all finish within, you know, they're, they're all number one. They finish within a hundredth of a second of each other. So I don't know if uh, my friend Alex is the smartest person in the world, but he's within a hundredth of a second. <laughs> so let's look at, um, uh, you can turn the mic on, he can hear. We, we can't let him hear that, me physically say that, or well, his head will get way too big. Uh, so let's go back now to our, uh, I want to share one more thing, one more bit of Cal. Um, history for you. Uh, if you could uh, go to the big screen and put the screen on for us again. Uh, Cal Stanford's is uh, the home of one of the most memorable plays in college football history. So we'll go here to uh, 1982 Memorial Stadium uh, and Cal the game is tied. Stanford kicked a field goal with seven seconds left. All they have to do is kick off, and they're probably going to win the game. But let's see what happened. They're up by three points. Rogers along the sideline. The voice of Joe Starkey, uh, Cal, play-by-play um, uh, -play radio announcer, uh, now uh, enshrined in history. Uh, that uh, uh, fantastic finish uh, to that football game. Uh, part of the reason, part of the uh, rivalry uh, is, of course, that exact uh, play. So uh, we talked about uh, bond energies a lot, and we referred to this in your in some biology textbooks. They call this a high energy bond, and we hated that. We talked about that when we learned about bond energy. If you take nothing else home from Chem One, take home the fact that it always requires energy to break a bond. That's always an endothermic process. You have to pull things apart. Energy is never released when you break a bond. But the, chem the biology textbooks, some kind, they, they, they're not very precise about that. And they say breaking that bond, going from ATP, adenosine triphosphate, to ADP, adenosine diphosphate, removing one phosphate, breaking that bond, releases energy. And that's the energy that was stored. That is not true, technically. 
breaking that bond requires energy. Uh, the actual chemical reaction of the hydrolysis of ATP under the conditions that that's under, that is an exothermic process. That is down free energy hill. So we can extract work. Your body can extract work from that chemical reaction, but the energy doesn't come from that bond. The energy comes from the making of other bonds and the orientation of the new ions in solution. So we understand that the free energy change for this chemical reaction, minus 30 kilojoules per mole, that is a spontaneous chemical reaction. We can use that energy to do useful work in our cells. There's the enthalpy change, also negative, and the entropy change, slightly positive for that chemical reaction. So if that's the case, here's the hydrolysis reaction. So you have water come in, uh, reacting here. This bond is formed while that bond is broken. So you can see bonds being broken, another bond being formed, and those bonds being formed and the energetics of the charge separation is what gives you that exothermic process. But that brings us to an interesting chem quiz here. Certain bacteria can live around thermal vents at 100 degrees C, hotter than boiling water. The, boiling, the hottest than boiling water can exist at the uh, depths at the ocean because the pressure is so intense. And we know the pressure can prevent, can raise the boiling point, prevent that water from boiling. So we can exceed the normal boiling point of water, 100 degrees C. The question is, are those bacteria, can they use bacteria, can those bacteria use ATP as their energy source? Is that something you can tell from what you've seen so far? Yes, no, or maybe? Let's talk about that quickly, and we'll take a vote. So the poll is started. You have a uh, yes, no, or maybe. Can ATP be used as an energy source at 100 degrees? Um, you've got that captured now on your, your quiz software. So I'll go back to this. Uh, and I'll show you that uh, thermodynamic numbers in case that helps you decide uh, on this one.
Okay, let's come back and see what you're thinking there. Uh, most of us uh, think yes. Well, a third of us. The, the other third is uh, thinking no or you can't tell. Um, not many people said can't tell. There's the, I'm sure there's the, the, the thought in the classroom that can't tell is a boring uh, answer. And um, there probably is an answer. And yes, you can tell. Why can you tell? Because we gave you these thermodynamic parameters for that hydrolysis. And we saw the free energy. These are at 25 degrees C. We saw that negative free energy change. That's why it's useful uh, at our bodies up to uh, our body temperatures around um, uh, in the 30s Celsius. What about in the 100 Celsius? Is it, does it continue to be useful? Well. Delta G is a function of temperature. And we saw that that was a function of temperature. So we're going quite a ways back now, reviewing the entire semester here in one day as uh, we want to do for our final tomorrow. And we can say the slope of Delta G versus T is given by the entropy. The intercept on the Y axis is given by the enthalpy. The enthalpy is negative, negative intercept. The slope delta S is positive times minus T delta S. There's the minus sign there, and T is Kelvin always positive. So this is negative. The slope is negative. So at all temperatures, that reaction is spontaneous. There'll be a release of free energy, and the release of free energy means we could do useful work on that in that system from the standard state anyway. Small caveat. So yes, theoretically possible for them to do it. And of course, they are, uh, they are doing it. The bacteria aren't that unique. They live at over 100 degrees C at tremendous pressures. But they, uh, so they're remarkable that they can do that. But they function like uh, uh, normal cells uh, in, in most every other respect. That means they're doing this. They're oxidizing glucose and using that as an energy source. Here is the glucose molecule. So this combustion reaction, our bodies are something like little engines burning glucose. And we exhale carbon dioxide and water. So we have those waste products by uh, burning this fuel. Here is uh, the glucose molecule. It's a it's a ring. So I've I, I drew it in a straight line, but I connected these two carbons because it's a ring, uh, a ring like molecule. Here's oxygen. We're familiar with that. Carbon dioxide and water. We understand all those uh, structures. Their Lewis dot structures. Their bond angles. Their bond orders and their oxidation numbers. So let's look at the oxidation numbers. Uh, for carbon in glucose, the oxidation number is zero uh, overall. There's a lot of them. Um, so if you draw the Lewis dot structure, you can have uh, some, some plus and minus one uh, numbers. But by and large, the zero oxidation state of carbon in glucose, it goes to plus four in carbon dioxide. An increase in oxidation number. That's an oxidation. Oxygen, all elements in their standard state have zero oxidation number. That goes to minus two in water. So that's a reduction. A reduction in oxidation number is a reduction. That's easy to remember. So that combustion reaction is also an oxidation reaction. Carbon is oxidized, and you can see we've added oxygens to the carbon, so it even looks like it's oxidized. That chemical reaction happens in your cells, and it is the major source of energy in your cells. That energy is transferred to ATP and then taken to other places in your cells. The way this reaction happens in your body is spectacular. I said on the first day, that by the last day, 
we'll be able to understand how that reaction happens in your body. And we needed every single day of this semester to get to where we can understand how this happens in your body. But it's a beautiful summary of Chem 1A now to look at that happening in the mitochondria, the little organelles inside the cells of our body, how that reaction happens in your body. And we're gonna have to take into account everything we know about Chem 1 to do that. So here I've drawn a chemical membrane, these blue and yellow. We didn't get a chance to talk about the assembly of membranes in this uh, class. You'll talk about it a lot. There's a uh, beautiful entropic and enthalpic uh, spontaneous processes that make molecules in your body form cell walls or cell membranes. And uh, that uh, that's a spontaneous process. It's, it's beautiful to study that. We'll just take for the fact that there's a membrane, it can separate parts of your cells into various compartments, cell walls. And here are the compartments in the mitochondria. So all this is inside a mitochondria. There's this inner membrane in the mitochondria. There's intermediate space between this uh, membrane and then there's another wall that's the outer wall of the mitochondria. And then this is more interior space. This is called the mitochondrial matrix inside this second membrane. And the oxidation of glucose happens in this inter, this matrix space. <laughs> this goes right back to that movie. And it's going to look eerily similar because we're going to see that in this matrix, your body is acting like a battery. If you watched the Matrix movies, that's the whole idea. The AIs take over the world. They use us as little batteries to power their machines. So it, it's eerily true that that could happen. So the oxidation happens inside the um, mitochondrial matrix anaerobically in a sense. By that, I mean the oxygen is not there. Oxygen molecules are not there. The oxidation happens formally as electrons. We go from oxidation state zero to plus four. Those electrons are removed from the carbon. And we have oxygen molecules, oxygen atoms on the sugar to start doing that rearrangement. It's 24 electrons are removed from every uh, sugar molecule and hydrogens and that is done by uh we won't get into all the details but it's done by enzymes proteins complicated complex large molecules that catalyze chemical reactions they allow these reactions to go under the conditions of your cell so i don't have to have a flame and an explosion the activation barrier is very low and those enzymes literally chaperone they guide the electrons and protons from the reaction to the membrane and along the membrane so all these electrons and protons that uh, are released are guided along the membrane here are two more proteins two more enzymes embedded in the membrane and the electrons are transported along the membrane as the protons are pumped out from one side of the matrix to, <laughs> to the outside. That, that can happen. You can push protons away and guide these electrons because oxygen now outside is going to accept those electrons and come back through the matrix and uh, the membrane, pick up two protons. There's all these protons here available. It's going to consume those and form water. So the oxidation occurs. Enzymes shepherd the electrons and the protons along outside the membrane and form water. So the oxidation and the reduction 
happen in two separate beakers, two separate places, membrane vesicles, just like we did with the galvanic cells. Was it just yesterday? <laughs> That's how fast we go in chemistry. Just yesterday, we saw you could take an oxidation and a reduction and do it in two separate places and create a voltage, the potential for these electrons to flow. The free energy released by that overall oxidation reduction reaction, that free energy release is what drives that formation. And the crazy thing is, you think, oh, I'm getting all this energy out, that the reason that though we're coupling this is actually it's the proton pumping that we're after. The mitochondria, all the mitochondria wants to do is pump protons from the matrix to the uh, intermediate space. Because then they're going to, the mitochondria is going to have another enzyme use that protein, that proton gradient. Now there is excess protons up here. The protons are consumed in this reaction and they're physically pumped in that reaction. So protons build up out here. There are more protons up here. So now there's a potential for them to want to come back through. So at another point in the membrane, a beautiful, gigantic protein complex called ATPase, ATP synthase, it makes ATP from ADP, it phosphorylates, it allows those protons to come through. And as those protons come through, it couples that release in free energy. Now it's a proton gradient, and we're equalizing the proton. So remember we talked about the concentration cell, how, pro how the concentrations will try to equalize themselves, and there's a potential associated with that. That potential is being used to, as for every three protons that come through, ATP, ACE can add a phosphate onto A. DP to make ATP, and then that's your energy source molecule for the rest of the body. Absolutely amazing uh, chemistry. And the fact that this has all been worked out in exquisite detail is a triumph of uh, modern science. This enzyme complex itself is spectacular. This actually works like a little motor the protons come through and it this part of it churns as the protons come through they force it around pump, 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 pump. it actually moves pump it's actually a little pump running on the proton gradient and using that chemical and kinesthetic energy to cram a phosphate onto an adp and you can watch it happen. We know it's happening. Electron microscopy is so good that you can watch it in action. Uh, there's an animation. Um, I don't think I queued it up. Uh, but let's see if we can watch it. This is just a cartoon of it. The Nordic Track Free Stride Trainer is an elliptical, a stepper, Sorry about the ad there. Here's that ATP ACE. Here's the membrane. A proton is locked here and it's going to get pumped through. And as it does that, this physically turns this part of the molecule. And up here in this part of the molecule, ADP and phosphate are going to bond. So here comes your uh, ADP and phosphate. They're going to bond on there. And then as the proton pumps through that little channel, that entire complex moves. And for each proton, it moves 120 degrees and allows the phosphorylation of ATP to happen. An actual chemical motor in your mitochondria. Absolutely spectacular evolution. Uh, Google that and read about uh, all of it, the evolution of the whole process. You can see the actual electron micrographs of this complex in the 
uh, in the membrane, just spectacular, spectacular chemistry. Uh, if you're not amazed by life <laughs> yet, <laughs> oh my God, all that chemistry that we've learned, we can understand that uh, process. So <clears throat> let's do a chem quiz <laughs> from the sublime to the mundane. <laughs> my, uh, my calculus professor in, uh, in college, uh, uh, first semester calculus, he would, always, uh, he would always say that. We would do some kind of proof and it would be beautiful. And then he would say, oh, but now we have to do a calculation based on that. So we go from the sublime to the mundane. <laughs> so we're going to go from the sublime to the mundane. How does the pH in the mitoc mitochondrial matrix compare to the intermediate space? So you had uh, uh, those two. Uh, we'll talk through this, this one uh, together. This is the kind of thing, uh, a, a question you can answer. It's essentially a simple question to answer in a sense because here's what we're talking about. We're talking about the intermediate space and the matrix. <laughs> and Neo is in there somewhere. Uh, <laughs> but the reduction of or the oxidation of glucose caused excess protons we were able to use that free energy to build up a proton gradient and get excess proton here if there are excess protons here what causes what what ph is just the measure of the number of protons so if there are more protons here than here more h3o pluses here than here then it's a simple question if the, if there are this side is more acidic than this side. There's a pH gradient. If this is more acidic, is the pH higher or lower? It's lower. Lower pHs are more acidic. So out here in the matrix, the, uh, the pH is higher because it's a lower concentration of H pluses. So the excess of Protons in the intermediate space gives you a lower pH, and uh, the pH uh, of the matrix greater than the pH of the intermediate space. So we can apply our concepts, uh, everything we've learned in Chem 1, to understand uh, the basis of chemical energy, uh, and how we process energy in our cells. So let's talk about uh, the metabolism then a little bit more. We can do some accounting now. So if you, uh, we're going to call it a catabolic reaction as I uh, oxidize the glucose. We did this calculation. We know that that releases 3,000 kilojoules per mole when a mole of glucose is oxidized. And that is coupled to turning ADP into ATP. And then elsewhere in your cells, and that uh, one mole of glucose consumed can get you the conversion of about 38 moles of ADP to ATP. And then that's used elsewhere in your cells for this anabolic reaction where we take the amino acids so the free amino acids in our body, and we build the proteins that make uh, the structures of our uh, cells and organs. Oops, went to that a little quickly. So you can do that. You can form about four moles of peptide bonds for each one of these cycles you go through. So. Uh, consume a mole here, produce 38 moles there, release those, uh, that 38 moles of ATP, release that free energy, and build up proteins. So that is the 
a kind of an overall energy accounting of how your proteins are uh, synthesized, how they're built up in your body from using the energy of that oxidation of glucose. So let's do a chem quiz based on that. The combustion of glucose releases uh, 3,000 kilojoules per mole. How efficiently is that stored as ATP? So how efficient is that reaction there? Now, you need to know to do this. I'll start the... We have to look back at some of our numbers to do this, but we now have 3,000 kilojoules per mole. We know that reaction. How efficiently is it stored as the ATP? So how much energy is involved with 38 moles of ATP? I'll start the quiz, and then I'm going to go ahead one if you haven't. Um, shoot. Uh, I apologize. The number I wanted to be here is not here. Uh, do you remember the free energy <laughs> delta G for uh, the formation of one ATP, uh, one mole of ATP? That was around 30 uh, kilojoules. We'll just go through this. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't give you the uh, exact numbers here. Uh, we'll talk through this one together. Uh, you you probably have the printouts, you have the handouts and the notes. I'm not sure how many of these I gave you as uh, notes because I was editing this uh, up until uh, last night. Uh, but let's just go through the calculation. We understand how much energy is released. How much energy do we actually end up saving in the ATP? So when we make 38 moles of ATP, that's endothermic coupled to this exothermic process. But how efficient is it? How much energy is lost when we do that. Well, we can calculate it because the numbers are there. They just weren't on that slide. So uh, 38 moles of ATP, that was the 30 kilojoules per mole to make to phosphorylate one ADP to ATP. So that was in a previous slide. It just didn't make it on that, uh, that summary slide. Well, if it takes 3,000 kilojoules uh, per mole are released when I oxidize the glucose and I store 30 kilojoules for every about 40 ATP. So that's around 1,200 of those kilojoules are captured in the ATP reaction. That uh, So we did the exothermic, this endothermic reaction. We capture around 1,200. So we lose a bunch of it. OK, we uh, use about uh, a, th a third of it um, and the rest of it is is wasted. It's not that efficient a uh, reaction. So we're about 40 percent efficient in getting the energy from the oxidation of glucose to the ATP molecules drive that endothermic process. That's one reason you have to eat uh, so much. Uh, so uh, let me ask you this then. We talked about standard oxidation and reduction potentials. And here are the examples that we had, uh, three of them. And we looked at a large table of oxidation and reduction potentials. We know now that this glucose reaction is also a redox reaction, oxidation reduction reaction, happening in two separate vessels. So just as copper and zinc ions and zinc metal and copper metal can be put in two separate beakers, our oxygen and water and our glucose and carbon dioxide in two separate uh, vesicle locations inside the mitochondria, that little battery uh, exist. So the question I have for you is, uh, what is, what voltage can I get in a, across the membrane of the mitochondria? If that voltage is being maintained by the, that pair 
of reactions. So let's think about that for a minute and we'll take a vote. You need the information from the previous slide, of course. So we'll start this, stop that last one. Sorry. And we'll start. I don't know if I've started or stopped. I'm going to try one more time. Okay, I believe I started the the uh, counter. Let's talk about this uh, amongst ourselves using some of this previous information if we need it. And we'll take a vote. Okay.
Yes. No. Okay. For goodness sakes. Uh, okay, guys, uh, we're going to come back together. Um, you guys and your what's going to be on the final. None of what biochemistry is on the final. Zero. This is all simply application so you can understand what's going on. Goodness gracious. What do you, what do you think I am? <laughs> all we're looking at is the beauty of the biochemistry and how we can understand it with our simple chemical principles. I, I told you yesterday, when we stopped, that was it. Nothing else uh, is on the final beyond where we stopped yesterday. This is all just the application so you can see it in action. So this was a, a very interesting and challenging uh, chem quiz. Let's see what you're thinking. Um, we're thinking uh, mainly B on that one, so about one volt. So let's see if uh, 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 what I think, and I agree with the one volts. So here, you had to realize a couple things, and you had to... I'm not sure where the solution to this one is. Slides might be out of order. But you had to realize a couple things, and the couple things were on previous slides. So if you know the free energy, even if these reactions happen in different vessels, two different vessels, if you know the free energy of the whole reaction, so this reaction happens in one vessel, that reaction happens in another beaker, or oxygen going to water happens in one beaker, and carbon dioxide, uh, glucose going to carbon dioxide happens in another beaker. Even if they happen in different beakers, you can take the free energy and calculate the voltage. Yesterday, we were taking voltages from these standard voltages and getting free energies, but you can go back the other way. If you know the free energy of this reaction, you can calculate the voltage. It's the number of electrons transferred times Faraday's constant, times the voltage gives you the free energy. The important thing we wanted to remember is that negative sign. Positive voltages are negative free energies. Positive voltage is a spontaneous reaction where negative free energy differences are the spontaneous reaction. So uh, in this case, uh, that's all we had to do. And you might have seen uh, uh, Sophia, you might even recognize her, she's here a lot, uh, was scribbling on the board. Well, if the standard state free energy is minus N F delta E, we had to know this N, and N is the number of electrons transferred. In that copper zinc oxidation, it was two. And that number you would have had to go back to the first slide or or remember that I said this reaction was a 24 electron transfer. So 24 electrons is our N for that one. So we can say that the, the voltage is the free energy change over N and F. And there's a negative sign there. So this is 3,000 kilojoules. But if I'm going to use Faraday's constant, I have to have a, an energy in joules. So 3,000 times 10 to the third joules over Faraday's constant, which is around 100,000. You saw it, 96,000 there. So let's just put 100,000 because we're just looking for an estimate there. And N, which is 24. But let's make the math real easy. That's around 30. And then the math is super easy. That number is about one. OK? So there it is, the little batteries that those AI in the matrix were going after, one volt little batteries in each are our mitochondria is what they were going after. Would not have worked anyway, because if you watch the, what they did was the AI would use our little electrochemical energy and run their machines. But then uh, when, and they used the matrix, the artificial reality to keep the bodies interested so they'd stay alive. But then when they did die, they just flushed them out, digested them all, and then fed back 
those juices to keep the other ones going metabolically. Now that doesn't work. <laughs> so first part of the matrix, maybe you'll get some voltage there. Second part, no, that's not sustainable because all that digested matter from the, the uh, people putting it back into the uh, same system, that cannot work. You have already extracted the free energy from the system. That's the amount of useful work cannot then take the leftovers and and go back in a full circle and get the same amount of useful work a second time that was the the second and third law of thermodynamics energy is conserved but entropy is not entropy always increases and the increase in entropy of the universe is reflected there in that you extracted free energy and did work then you took the products and tried to recycle them. But even though that was a complete cycle, entropy of the universe still increased and the amount of useful work, the next cycle, goes down. And that difference that it goes down, that's reflective of the entropy increase of the overall circular process. So you can have a cycle. Thermodynamically, the energy is conserved. Entropy is not and the free energy you can extract on each cycle drops by that entropic factor. Uh, okay, wonderful, beautiful. We're about at the end, goodness gracious, of uh, an eight weeks crash through uh, general chemistry. Um, uh, let me ask, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna throw one more chem quiz up because it's a simple one and if you don't, don't get it. I'm going to be mad. Uh, here are the two reactions we were just talking about. The mitochondrial battery oxidation of glucose. We could do it in a calorimeter and measure that 3,000 kilojoules per mole accurately. The question is, what would the difference between the reaction done here and the reaction done here in the energy released? Would those be different? And you better be screaming, no, absolutely not. Energy is a state function. If I do it this way, if I do this crazy path between glucose and carbon dioxide and water, or this kind of more straightforward path between glucose and carbon dioxide and water, initial conditions, glucose and oxygen, final conditions, carbon dioxide and water, state function, delta E is the same. If you take nothing else home from Chem 1, take home the fact that energy, a state function, depends only on the initial and final conditions. If you take nothing else home from Chem 1A, take home the fact that you loved Chem 1A deep down, despite the pain. <laughs> I have office hours now. I'm going to hang around here. Uh, I hope that I get to meet each and every one of you when you come to Cal. Uh, I'm here in 208 Stanley. You can uh, look me up. Uh, we check all weapons at the door. Uh, <laughs> please, please come with goodwill and come say hi when you get here to Berkeley in the fall. Uh, I had a good time. I hope you guys had at least some fun. I'll stick around for office hours. But other than that, uh, Chem 1A lectures are over. Yay. Okay, we'll go right to... So, questions? On the last slide, uh, there's a negative in front of the end, and like at the end, yeah. you put the negative. Would it be a negative one, or would it be two times the negative? Uh, good question. So, um, Sophia just asked, uh, we were doing this, <clears throat> we did that calculation, and we took the free energy, and there was that negative NFE. Uh, yeah, that negative sign is there, yes. But delta G was negative. So we I didn't put minus 3,000 in there. I just put 3,000. So those two negatives cancel out, and it was plus 1 volt. It's minus 3,000 equals minus NFE. 
So those minuses do cancel out. It is a plus one volt that you get uh, that is spontaneous. We had minus 3,000 kilojoules, so that's spontaneous. It can't be non-spontaneous if you just convert it to voltage. Voltage had to be positive, and that formula tells you negative free energies give you positive voltages. That's why that negative is there. Okay, good question. Other things coming from the gallery. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, the question is, uh, Faraday's constant is the charge on a mole of electrons. Why is it positive? Uh, uh, it's the it's the magnitude of the charge uh, and and not the sign. There's no real uh, fundam. If you took a, a mole of electrons, yes, you'd have minus uh, 100,000 coulombs, Faraday's uh, constant uh, charge. Uh, but when we use the constant, we just say that's the magnitude. Uh, it, it helps uh, so many minuses come in here or there. You don't know whether the electrons are going being as oxidizers or reducers. So just take the magnitude of the charge and worry about the sign uh, later, basically. Other questions? Nothing come in live. Anything in the Zoom? You guys are so completely overwhelmed. Uh, okay. Okay. All right, we'll take a break uh, and wrap it up. I have to go write that final anyway. <laughs> so I need the time. Yes? Uh, how do salt bridges work? Because I am so aware. Uh, the question is, how do salt bridges work? And what ions go where so when we did uh when we put our two when we put our two beakers together we put this salt bridge in between the beakers and then we collected connected the electrodes by a wire so this was just a wire and these were the electrodes and this thing was what we called a salt bridge and i glossed over it because it's not uh super important uh that you know how that functioned uh but this salt bridge has uh, ions. You can think of it, you can say there's just any salt you want, say sodium chloride in kind of a paste in there. So it's sodium ions and chlorine ions in a paste in there. And what that is meant to do is make sure that the overall charge balance can be maintained. Because if I use up an ion, say I have a... a uh, I don't care what it is, a copper ion plus two plates out onto this. So it accepts two electrons and becomes copper metal. It accepted two electrons. You lost two plus charges over here. The electrons are coming from over here. So the electrons get to go here, but you lost two plus charges in your solution here. So if you lost two plus charges in your solution, well, what the salt bridge does is say, well, if you're going to lose two, I'll just have two Na pluses dis dissolve out of that salt bridge and two Cl minuses uh, and I'll, or one Na plus and one Cl minus, whatever it takes to keep the total ionic strength, the total charge of the ions balanced. If you didn't do that, you couldn't just pull positive charges out of that solution. You have to keep that completes the circuit by keeping the charge balance between those two. Okay? It's not something that's super important that uh, you know. Yes? Uh, 
Uh, Grace asks, uh, what is the mass change? Uh, I like the spirit of the question. And I think, I think that's one of the questions in the homework. And so you might see it on the final. Um, you can calculate. So uh, we said when that, that chemical reaction occurred that we would have uh, we would have exactly kind of what I drew there, copper ions plate out, become copper metal. So that is happening. That's the product of the chemical reaction. It was copper ions plus zinc metal went to copper solid and zinc ions. So copper metal is a product and it does build up. So the mass of this electrode will increase, but you can figure out, you, you can do the stoichiometry. If you say one mole of copper ions is consumed in the reaction, that would form one mole of copper solid. This electrode would get heavier by one mole of copper or our whatever the stoichiometry is. So the mass of that electrode increases, the mass of the zinc electrode decreases by the mass of zinc moles that are dissolved and the copper, uh, so the copper electrode gets heavier, the zinc electrode gets less massive. And you would just calculate it from the stoichiometry of the chemical reaction. Uh, I think in the homework you might have said, how much would it change if a certain number of amps, so if you know, uh, one amp of current flowed, one amp. Well, you can do the stoichiometry from that because an amp, say one amp was turned on for 30 seconds. So you ran one amp for 30 seconds. How far would the reaction go? Well, this is just this is just a number of uh, electrons. It's just a number of coulombs. So you can say an amp is a coulomb per second. So we ran one coulomb per second for 30 seconds. And that means we'd get a number of coulombs. And we can figure out how many moles of electrons that is in that number of coulombs because we have Faraday's constant, the charge on one mole of electron. So we get the number of moles of electrons. And that says, well, two moles of electrons would make one mole of copper. And we just do the stoichiometry with the electrons and get to moles of copper. Yes? Uh, Swathi asks, do pH meters uh, work the same way that voltmeters work uh, by electric potential? And the answer is absolutely yes. There's many kinds of pH meters, but one kind of pH meter you could use is exactly that. Uh, the, the standard hydrogen electrode is a pH meter. It gives you a voltage based on the H plus concentration. So absolutely, that's one way you could do it. Um, uh, they, they all, they all revolve on some electric potential based on some ion. Uh, uh, that's the basic uh, way we do pH. Yes. On the final, will we be given the standard reduction potentials for problems that we have? Yeah. Uh, the question is, will you get standard reduction potentials? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we don't want you to look anywhere, but the the uh, exam and your equation seat. And you know, when, when you need delta H's, we give you delta H's. When you need delta E's, we'll give you delta E's. Yes? Uh, the, question, the question formally is, in, for the chem quizzes today, why is delta H to delta G equal to the heat of combustion. Maybe the last chem quiz, I, I don't know which one you're talking to. I, I, I'll just tell you, I was being very flippant with the delta Gs, delta Hs, delta Es. So um, 
Delta G is not formally the enthalpy. The uh, enthalpy, that last chem quiz, the enthalpies, whether you do it in the beaker or in the cell, they are the same. Uh, the free energies are the same as well. So you could have used either one. Um, it, short answer, it's not. The D, delta G is not the enthalpy or... Uh, and I'm, I was just being flippant. I was just being energy is energy is kind of what I was doing. Sorry if I, uh, the, the take home lesson is they're all conserved. The only one that's not conserved is the entropy. So the question applies, is something conserved to all of them except entropy? Others? Okay. Okay, great, guys. We will, uh, good luck tomorrow night. Uh